take on the question of can the unions make us strong again and we're looking at the past the present and the future of the labor movement and we've got uh, two extraordinary guests for you and the first is Mary Kay Henry who is the president of the two million plus uh, member SEIU the Service Employees International Union a great fighting tough union that has been in the forefront of standing up for workers rights during COVID-19 uh, all over the country, not just for their members, but for everybody else. But Mary Kay's done uh, a remarkable work in organizing in the health sector, in the public sector, in uh, the property uh, maintenance and, cu and custodial work uh, sector of the economy. And, um, but she is an ally to working people everywhere. And so we're thrilled to hear from her. And then you're also gonna get to hear from uh, a brilliant union lawyer in Boston named Michael Anderson who happens to be my best friend from college and law school and is an exceptionally creative and nimble thinker about the labor movement and developing uh, tactics to advance the rights of working people. Um, so these are our two guests for today. We welcome you both. And um, we have now, I don't know if we're around 125 or 150 Democracy Summer Fellows, but we also get people's parents uh, coming to check it out. And we get funders and friends and people all over the country um, and so uh, we know you're helping us to build support for Democracy Summer, which is channeling the amazing idealism and energy of young people into serious thinking and learning about the uh, civilizing movements of the past and then the current crisis that we're in and what young people need to be doing to make sure we get America through this nightmare and put ourselves back on the, the path of strong democracy. So with that, I'm gonna to introduce to you uh, President Mary Kay Henry, take it away. Thank you so much, Congressman Raskin, for your incredible leadership and so many fights for justice. And I can't tell you how privileged I feel to join uh, Democracy Fellows in this moment, because uh, we need our democracy now more than effort uh, to face the crisis. And my answer to the question is yes, the union can make us strong. And I really hope this time for us together will help arm you with the ways in which I think unions matter to make sure we have clean air and clean water. Union matters make, to make sure that every immigrant feels welcome um, in this country and is not scapegoated by a politics of hate. Uh, unions matter for making sure that we win racial justice and tear down the systems and structures that hold racism in place. And unions matter for winning uh, economic justice for everybody in this country. But in our case, SEIU fights for economic and racial justice for 2 million service and care workers all across the economy. And we're fighting to make sure that 4 million fast food workers finally win a union um, because uh, we need to end poverty wage work uh, in America. So let me just um, make my case and then let Michael talk. And then I think, Jamie, we wanna encourage as many questions and answers as possible. I think the first thing that SEIU members believe is that all of us, no matter what our race, our religion, our immigration status, uh, we all want the same things. Uh, we want health and security for our families and we want a better future uh, for our children. And that we believe in this moment of COVID economic devastation and racial justice, uprisings that we have to act boldly in ways that frankly I think were unthinkable just five months ago. I don't know about the rest of you but we see the promise of radical change in rewriting systems and structures of power more possible today than we certainly did in January. And that's because we're in a state of national emergency and we have to push um, people past business as usual uh, and make clear that COVID has laid bare uh, the racial and economic injustice that we knew long before the pandemic and long before George Floyd's murder. And that we have a moral requirement um, as a people to fix these injustices once and for all. I've heard a, a leader of ours in Atlanta say to me, I am not going to pass the same world on to my children. Um, it, we can't be having this conversation 50 years from now, and it's on us and our generation uh, to make systemic change. And 
We're hearing that from workers on the front lines of this pandemic. 75% of SEIU members have been going to work, even as many of us have had the privilege of staying at home and working from home. And they still don't have personal protective equipment uh, that they need to keep themselves and their families and the people they serve safe. Most do not have any additional hazard pay and most have still, still after five months, uh, no paid sick leave as a condition of their work. And um, it's made clear uh, to us that major corporations and the current occupant and the White House and the Republican Senate are willing to uh, risk the lives of primarily black and brown workers on the front lines of this pandemic. And we know that mostly black and brown workers are holding essential healthcare, security officer, janitorial, delivery, grocery uh, jobs on the front line and are not working with PPE, are more likely to get sick and the lack of investment of healthcare in these communities means that most of these workers are not seeking medical attention when they do get sick and are trying to power through the virus at home. Uh, some workers are worried about ICE um, detaining them if they uh, seek medical help and other workers are just are terrified of the bills uh, that medical attention would provide and that we know that government uh, and corporations have always left them unprotected with lower wages, fewer services in black and brown communities, no health care, no union rights. Uh, and that too many people, 64 million, earn less than $15 an hour, don't have health care, uh, and they're being put on the edge of survival and are the most at risk. And, I don't know if you're experiencing this, but our members on the front lines, the essential workers that we're trying to organize think there's been way too much lip service about how we're all in this together. And there's been way too much lip service on how black lives matter uh, from major corporations like McDonald's who still do not provide PPE, still are not paying living wages, and still will not allow workers who get um, infected at work to stay at home with paid time in order to self-quarantine. And that uh, hypocrisy between what they say as part of their corporate brand and what they're doing has to end. And we think unions are a key ingredient to checking corporate uh, power. Um, and that's why we, say that the rules have always been rigged against the very people who are essential workers. Um, women and people of color during COVID have experienced the status quo, but we see the past five months as a shock to the system and creating a reckoning on both the economy and on racial injustice. And that the shock has woken us up to the crisis and our members have decided that we refuse to go back to normal. We, that normal never worked for us. And so we're, we launched a campaign to protect all workers that made a set of demands in the pandemic. We support the movement for black lives and the nine demands that they've made. And that's why we're gonna use every ounce of this union's energy to organize, to show up and vote, to motivate infrequent voters in communities of color to show up and vote because we think we have to rebuild uh, workers' power. And we will rewrite the rules and create unions in cities and states where we have political uh, champions like Congressman Jamie Raskin that are willing to throw their weight behind workers forming unions. And that's why we're gonna continue to organize and elect Vice President Joe Biden and get him to help us organize the fast food sector by calling the three CEOs that uh, control fast food in this country, McDonald's, Wendy's and Burger King to a national table and create a national collective bargaining agreement like these companies do in countries around the world. And that's why we're gonna to continue to back frontline workers in our union and across the country who are demanding that we protect all workers. And so that's the, the 
belief and uh, passion that our members enter this crisis moment with, which is we think this moment creates the biggest opportunity in our generation to have explosive growth of labor unions, just like we did in the 30s, except this time we're gonna include women and people of color on a scale like never before and take poverty wage service jobs, home care, fast food, child care, and turn those jobs into the foundation of the next most racially diverse, most inclusive uh, middle class that this country's ever seen. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you, Mary Kay. Everybody give her a standing or sitting ovation as the case may be. <laughs> Not necessary, <laughs> thank you. That was awesome. And I, I just want to make two points before I bring Michael on. One is, you know, your point about how, um, you know, people on the front lines are sick of the lip service. Um, pretty early on in the crisis, I went and I spoke to a bunch of nurses and one of them said something that stuck with me where she, she said, uh, you know, tell the Republicans um, to stop calling us hero and then treating us like martyrs because I don't want to be a martyr and I, I don't want to be your hero. Just pay us right, give us the rules that we need, and OSHA still hasn't delivered rules, give us the equipment we need, you know, and th they can save the, you know, the cakes and all that. So I appreciate that. Um, look, I'm uh, delighted because you obviously are um, one of the most creative union leaders we got in the country to connect you with uh, one of the most creative union lawyers we've got in the country. Uh, Michael Anderson, and uh, I, I got a note from my friend Damon Silvers, who I know is close to both of you guys, saying what a brilliant pairing. So uh, the fellows uh, are, are in for quite a treat in the discussion uh, with Michael and with you uh, and the questioning that we're going to do afterwards. But right now, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Anderson. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to share the screen. So tell me if it's not working. Do you have that? We got it. You have it? Yeah. Okay, I want to give something besides a linear narrative about the history of the labor movement because we don't have the time and it would be just too way too boring. Uh, I want to give you just sort of 10 isolated thoughts about how worker resistance got to the point that we're at today and where we can take it in the future. Uh, first is a kind of a semantic point that I always want to make, that I don't like being called a labor lawyer, and I kind of chafe at the description of American workers as a collective entity called labor, because labor is how capital defines its own needs. Labor is something that capital needs in order to make a profit. I don't feel like I represent labor as an abstract entity. I represent working people. And acting collectively, what we're trying to do on behalf of working people is to give them more power than just being a commodity that capital buys. I want to make my working people that I represent into players in the economic game. And the old English anarchist slogan was, we don't just want more cake, we want the whole damn bakery. And that is where I think the labor movement has always been uh, when at, at its most successful and its most militant times. All right, next, I wanna go all the way back to before the Civil War. I, I think something that's always ignored about the narrative about how the United States finally confronted the blight of slavery is that it ignores the actions of the enslaved workers themselves rising up against their masters the way that Nat Turner did. And it also, acts as though the anti-slavery sentiment of the North just came from some exceptionally woke abolitionists. That's not actually the, the full story of what happened. And it, this hooks into where we're at now because the, the story about Northern resistance to slavery has to do with the way that free labor in the North was threatened by being dragged into the sinkhole of a Southern systems that profited off unfree labor, that let's say farmers in Pennsylvania uh, uh, or, or, or Michigan wouldn't be able to sell their products at a fair co competitive price if they were up against the, co the competition of slave owners in the South that didn't have to pay for their labor. So 
as you have the building, uh, the, the building sentiment uh, uh, against against slavery in the North, you it, it's really being driven by the economic interests of Northern workers in the Northern free states that are hostile to slavery because they don't want to be dragged into the unfree labor vortex that their, the Southern competitors were creating. And this is why, you know, in the in the in the beginning of the Civil War, even before Fort Sumter, like the 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 effective beginning of the Civil War in Kansas, you had the the the, the opponents of slavery saying, "No white slavery." We, you know, we're fighting against the extension of this system of unfree labor into our territory because ultimately, as free soilers, we're going to be dragged down into that system ourselves. Now, after the Civil War, capital takes a different tack. It's no longer operating on, you know, ex express slavery. But what is happening is that capital is allowing itself to organize through trusts, through limited liability, publicly traded stock, the fact that shareholders are pooling their economic power to create a single imperial entity that enjoys all of their collective strength where the individual constituents of the corporation don't have any downside except the loss of the value of their stock. This is why co the corporate form was so crucial in the, uh, uh, toward the end of the 19th century. And the beginning of the labor movement was really conceived as, as just workers trying to avail themselves of the same tactic, that if shareholders and capitalists can pool their resources to create a corporation, workers can do the same by creating a guild or a union. But in, in the beginning of the 20th century, you have two distinct models of organizing. On the left is the craft model, which is sort of represented by the building trades these days. And under this model, you form the union first. The workers' first allegiance is to local 802 of the Boilermakers. And once you sign the union card, then your union will farm your labor out through its hiring hall to whatever employers want to take it on. But the idea of the guild is that the union exists prior to any relationship with management. Now, this model had a lot of problems. In the first place, the craft unions of the early 20th century were typically racist, sexist, and nativist, that they were all white boys clubs organized around ethnic lines because the craft was, was defined by you know, the, the brothers and cousins that people brought in to join the union. So you would have all Irish unions and all Italian unions, and they didn't think much of organizing people of color because they considered them as being a lower rung of the economic uh, ladder that they didn't want to have anything to do with. The industrial model shows up in the, in the 30s through the CIO, and it's a very progressive movement that says, we're not just going to organize the boiler makers we're going to tell U.S. Steel, we want to represent your entire, all the employees of your corporation. We want wall-to-wall -wall organizing. And the great thing about the industrial model is it was willing to organize unskilled workers. So you didn't have the, as much of the kind of um, like inherent you know, systemic racism that was present with the craft model. And this was incredibly effective in the 30s with the passage of the National Labor Relations Act. But one thing that started to happen, and I'll talk about this more you know, once we get to the present day, is that unions tended to lose their independent body and started to merge into the corporate personality that they were organizing. That if you belong to the UAW in 1945, you authorize the union to represent you in collective bargaining with, say, the Boeing Corporation. And your connection to the union only came through the fact that the Boeing Corporation was unionized. So it meant that the UAW acted almost like this kind of viral parasite that would attach itself to the human relations department of, of large corporations. Now, this was a necessary evil at the time because it was necessary for unions to organize coal and auto and steel and aerospace. But what people forget about the union successes of the 1930s is that they were made possible by tactics that are now illegal. 
that in the 1930s, unions exploded through the industrial structure because they had the power to take on an entire industry. That if you had a labor dispute with an employer, you could set up a picket line, not only at the employer, but at the bank that lended to the employer, at the customers that did business with the employer. So you had the possibility of spreading a labor dispute through an entire sector of the economy. This was made illegal in 1947, that basically once the Republicans took back power after the end of the World War II, and the, the New Deal came to an abrupt end, and they passed the Taft-Hartley Act, that made that kind of secondary boycott illegal. They made the hot cargo illegal. It used to be that unions could say, we're not going to handle any goods that don't bear a union label. We're not going to trade in scab goods. That's illegal after 1947. The closed shop became illegal. It was no longer possible for a union to say, you shall only hire members of the UAW. All, the best that the union could do would be to say, you can hire anybody that you want, provided that after 30 days, they're required to join the UAW. And there's a big difference there because it means that a worker's corporate citizenship really attaches to the employer first. It's no longer that you're joining the Boilermakers, it's that you're getting a job with Boeing and then the human resources department says after 30 days, here, you gotta sign this card. It's part of your job that you're in the UAW. And that's a much more alienated relationship of workers to each other than existed in the old guild model. And it also produces uh, like problems that, that it's taken generations for the union movement to come to terms with. But every time I walk into like a, a union office that has one of those sexy World War II uh, CIO posters like this one up on the wall, there's always like a caption at the bottom that says like, fight for the CIO and win the war. And people forget how much the explosion of, the, of union organizing in the 30s and particularly in the 40s was connected with enthusiastic support for Roosevelt's war against fascism, which was clearly an important and, and, and necessary thing, but it also means that the industries that had historically been organized on, under the industrial model most, mostly have connections to the military industrial complex, coal, steel, auto, and aerospace, which also creates a problem once you hit the 1950s that corporations that are unionized end up using the unions as a kind of a human shield. We're seeing this more and more now in the courts where let's say uh, workers that have been discriminated against that file a race discrimination action, file a lawsuit against the employer and the employer says, well, you had a union contract, so if you're upset about something that we did to you as a matter of racial discrimination, you have to sue your union because the union ends up being like the hostage for corporations. Corporations are now making unions pay the price for the like intimate relationship that the uh, industrial model created. What we've, what we've also seen over the last 20 or 30 years is a growth of like just insanely inconsistent jurisprudence coming out of the right-wing courts that are elevating a right of conscience to work, but only where the conscience dictates opposition to unions or opposition to uh, LGBT rights or uh, opposition, to, uh, opposition to anything in the progressive agenda. Like we see, for instance, this is a picture of Kim Davis, who is the Kentucky court clerk, who says, you know, my reading of the Bible tells me that gay marriage is wrong and I shouldn't be forced to process applications by same-sex couples for marriage licenses. Well, there's an answer to that. Nobody's forcing you to believe in gay marriage, but that kind of disqualifies you from being a court clerk that, that hands out marriage licenses after the Oberfeld decision. But nevertheless, the courts are now falling all over the rights of right-wing dissenters in the workplace to opt out of any collective solidarity with, uh, uh, with, with unions. And this comes up most, uh, most of all in the right to work movements where the, you know, the National Right to Work Committee, which is the sole function is to destroy any binding union solidarity within the workplace are insisting no one should ever have to pay union dues it's, it's a violation of their right of conscience 
to pay dues to a union that they don't agree with, even though a majority of the people in the workplace have chosen the union, uh, you know, uh, have chosen the union for collective bargaining. And what this does, I mean, is it forces unions to operate as though they were charities, as though they are public television saying, we urge you to contribute to us for the service that we provide, even though you're under no obligation to do it. And as Mary Kay, uh, Henry can, can uh, fill, fill in, it is amazing just how much, even in right to work states, unions are still able to get working people to agree to pay money toward their fair share of the dues when they're acting only out of solidarity and not under legal compulsion, which is actually a really fantastic statement about how much we, we may be able to survive the right to work offensive. But just think of what you know, Justice Scalia or Justice Alito or Justice Thomas would say in any other context, if a worker in a meat packing plant declared, oh, I'm a vegan, I don't really believe in uh, being participating in the slaughter of animals, so I should get my full salary, but I should be able to opt out of working in, in the meatpacking plant in any way that offends my principles. Those justices would say, well, sorry, you can have those idea principles, but if you don't like working in this workplace, you don't have a right to opt out of something that is an inherent part of the workplace. And that's something that the unions are having to fight now uh, with the present court that's just finding all kinds of, um, you know, rights of right-wing dissent uh, uh, among workers. Uh, another piece of this um, is that since the 40s, employers have figured out that the law is a paper tiger, that a, a, an employer that's required to put up a posting with a blue eagle on it saying, we will not discriminate against you based on your union activity. You know, in 1941, they, they're worried that that is the thin end of the wedge, that FDR's new dealers are going to come seize the entire plant if they don't cooperate with the National Labor Relations Board. But now, you know, 50, 60 years later, employers have figured out that putting up a piece of paper five years after they commit massive labor law violations really doesn't slow down their anti-union agenda. That if they fire a union activist, the union activists will not be put back to work for three to five years. They're not going to get any kind of damages except for back pay. And even that has to be offset by whatever job they get in the interim. So you get workers who get fired during an organizing drive where the only thing that happens to the employer is that they might have to pay ten dollars or $20,000 five years after the fact. And that is no more than about two days worth of billing from their anti-union attorneys. It's completely a cost of doing business. I want to show you this. Um, my son Jackson took this picture because he just took a, a, a summer job at U-Haul. This is what's up at every U-Haul location now. And look how artfully this is read. They say, never sign an authorization card or petition. Now, you know, a, 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 a regular worker, particularly an immigrant who sees that, is not going to understand the difference between that as a persuasive appeal versus a command that if you do, you will be fired. And then there's just say no to union organizers. Tricks and treats are common in union organizing. And it's just like Trump saying, oh, many people are saying that union organizers can't be trusted. And then a toll-free number, and it's partially obscured at the bottom, but a promise that you will get a reward. We will pay you additional income if you give us any information that exposes excessive force or pressure against you by union organizers. And of course, anyone seeing this poster is going to think that any approach by a union organizer is scary and radioactive, and then think they've got both the duty and the opportunity to make money by turning them into the employer. This is the state of the workplace under the Trump NLRB. Now, to, to talk in a more positive light and just to follow up on what President Henry was talking about, about why unions are now not just motivated but compelled by economic reality to start fighting the fight against the oppression of immigrants, against the fight against, against the oppression of people of color, against sexism, against anti-LGBTQ discrimination. It's not just that we're suddenly so woke. It's that 
The unions will die unless we are able to organize people who have historically been oppressed. I represent hotel workers through Unite Here. I represent folks in, um, in SEIU 32BJ. These are industries, like the hotel industry, if you, if you try to organize the hotel industry, you are organizing Latino immigrants. If you're organizing people who do home health care, depending on what region you're in, you're organizing Caribbean, particularly Haitian uh, workers. And if you're not interested in defending them against anti-immigrant persecution, you're never gonna be able to organize them because they're gonna be too afraid to sign a card, too afraid to think that they have the right to stick their necks out and stand up for their rights in the workplace. So it's not just a matter of ideological enlightenment, it's a matter of economic reality that the SEIU and Unite Here and the most progressive unions in the AFL-CIO put the defense of immigrants, the defense of people of color, the defense of LGBTQ people at the top of our organizing agenda, because it's not a matter of altruism, it's a matter of solidarity. And finally, I just want to um, finish up with the problems created by the gig economy, the, the move that capital has made in the last five or 10 years is to try to dissolve the employment relationship so that Uber claims that it is not actually the employer of its drivers, that its drivers are all independent contractors who are only participating in its platform. And if they're right about that, what that means is not only that the drivers have no protections under the National Labor Relations Act, they can't like file an election petition to, uh, to, 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 to nominate a, um, you know, to, a, a union that they want to represent them, but any act between them to organize, to talk about what should be the prevailing rate for Uber drivers will be regarded as a form of price fixing. And Uber drivers that tried to organize with each other can now be prosecuted under the antitrust laws in just the way that like big corporations can be if they engage in price fixing themselves. Now, the first answer to that is we've got to fight the laws that like defy reality and describe these workers as independent contractors. They should be classified as employees. But if we, but until we win that, another model that I think that the, that you know we need to think about is simply getting back to the old guild structure, but importing into it everything that was good about the industrial model. We need to get back and say to uh, Uber drivers, okay, maybe we won't call it a union. Maybe we'll just call it a worker-owned labor leasing cooperative because you know there are plenty of temp agencies like Labor Ready that say, we have a pool of workers that we will hire out to you. It's like a capitalist hiring hall. No one thinks that there's anything wrong with that. So there's no reason why Uber drivers can't form their own worker-owned cooperative that leases out their labor to, uh, to Uber. And in that case, it's not price fixing. They've just formed what amounts to a worker-owned corporation and then bargains on the, on the basis of their economic power and leverage about what the prevailing rate should be for the leasing of, of, their, of their drivers, who are both the employees and the owners of the cooperative. And if that were to happen, we would be creating something that looks exactly like the guilds of the early 1920s. Only those organizations would not be like based on racist, sexist, exclusionary lines. Those would be those would be guilds that would that, that would that would be full of the um, the, the the features of the industrial uh, model of the labor movement that were so in, uh, important and aggressive in the 30s and 40s. I mean, that, that's, I mean, this is not to say that we abandon the industrial model altogether, but labor has to think outside the box because capitalism sure as hell is thinking outside the box and we can't be continually stuck fighting the last war. And with that, I'll turn it back to Jamie, by the way, and congratulations to Jamie that he's finally raised his chess rating to within 300 points of mine. So keep it up, Jamie. <laughs> I mean, more fake news as if I don't get enough at work every day. Um, all right, Mary Kay, Michael, thank you for those two superb presentations. And let's open it up to the Democracy Summer Fellows who have been thinking about labor, reading about labor, and now have these two great presentations to go on. So uh, I don't know, Maddie or Paul, which one of you is calling on people? 
Yeah, we've got a couple of questions from our fellows. Our first one is from Marika. Hi, I'm Marika. I'm a high school student in Montgomery County. First, I'd like to thank Representative Raskin and our speakers for this great dialogue. My question is, as the pandemic has placed a strong emphasis on the value of essential workers, how will the way they are treated change moving forward? And will these essential workers be more inclined to join and form unions if they haven't already? Mary Kay, will you take the first shot at that one? Yes, Marika, it's a great question. They, uh, essential workers are saying that they wanna be uh, treated like essential workers and not sacrificial. It's the sort of hero martyr thing that Jamie said at the beginning. And we're seeing three things. One is there's lots more self-organizing happening across essential workers, um, which I assume is why U-Haul has those warning posters up. People are seeing a value in joining together and making a demand. We've had three nursing homes where workers walked off the job and striked for their personal protective equipment and for uh, better health and safety for residents and um, then collected cards. And within three weeks, the employer recognized their union voluntarily. We haven't had that happen in nursing homes since the 30s. Um, so that's like a huge signal to me that if we were to reach out to more nursing home workers, we could probably organize them in the traditional way. But we're trying to figure out if we can get nursing home workers to a statewide table so they can bargain with the entire industry and the government to slow down the spread of the virus and to raise wages and create uh, benefits, uh, sick leave and healthcare that they can afford. That's what's happening in nursing homes. In fast food, all of the seven years of organizing work we've done in building leadership has created workers' confidence in strikes. I was with Oakland workers last week They've been on strike for 48 days, which has never happened uh, in the fast food sector uh, because they are confident if they would be uh, risking their lives because 20 of them got infected, two were in the hospital, and the rest of them said, you know, this may be the only way I can support my family, but I'm willing to sort of scrap together um, services and the goodness of the rest of the labor movement to try and make ends meet. And um, we've seen lots more organizing of Amazon and Google workers, which you've probably been watching on social media, that I think gives me incredible hope about breaking open the tech sector and those gig workers that Michael just uh, spoke about. So essential workers are not being paid or given benefits like that is equivalent to how essential they are, but they're trying to organize and through a union or some kind of organization make it. Great, Mary Kay, thank you so much. Michael, you got anything to add to this? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, the getting recognized as a union doesn't finish the fight. You have to end up with a stable contract and, uh, we, you know, Unite Here, for example, always preaches that if you're not willing to strike to get that contract, you may as well not bother with the organizing. And by, by, you know, by the converse, if you are willing to strike, you may get your recognition through the strike even before a government holds an election. Hmm. Great. Let's go to the next one, Maddie. Great. Our next question is from Nicholas. Thank you both for those uh, wonderful presentations and uh, Mr. Raskin for the opportunity at Democracy Summer. Uh, so my question is, in modern progressive struggles, we talk a lot and take a lot of time talking about intersectionality as a means to forming solidarity among progressive activists. So how could a rising labor movement work alongside our contemporary social movements, uh, such as BLM and the Sunrise Movement on uh, climate change, and et cetera, uh, and more movements? Um, in order to effectively move forward in all of their interest. Great. Mary Kay, you want to take a shot or? Well, I, I'd, I'd like to do it, Nico, and based on story, and then you tell me if there's other things. 
our union um, endorsed the Sunrise Movement demand for a Green New Deal in February of this year. And then we showed up with a Sunrise Move. Oh no, I'm sorry, last year. I'm sorry, I'm dealing in COVID time. The demand uh, for the Green New Deal was in January of 19, I think, Jamie. And so we then showed up with the Sunrise Movement on the strike for climate that they did, did in uh, March or April of last year by asking our members to join Sunrise organizers. And then we did a joint action at the July 30th um, Democratic debate last year that was trying to inject climate into the discussion. And so um, the intersection for us is we have nursing home workers, children who've been poisoned by uh, water in Flint. We have fast food workers who can't breathe because of pollution in Southwest Detroit. We have um, asthma as a pandemic for our black and brown members in key zip codes in California. So the intersection is in the lives of the people we represent and they find expression in the solidarity by linking with movements like Sunrise. On the movement for black lives, we had a very vigorous debate inside of SEIU that grew, grew out of a commitment that we made in 2016, that we had to have a very aggressive education program about the intersection of racial and economic justice. And for white workers who've been um, told lies um, about white supremacy and the uh, we're gonna do better if we don't align with black and brown workers, um, trying to make that case is a really key way, I think, to unlocking the intersections on all of our fights. And so we deepened the commitment that our union made to link racial and economic justice uh, at just uh, mid-June by saying that we stood in solidarity with the movement for black lives. That's why our union just sponsored with the rest of the labor movement that many other unions joined in a strike for black lives that was to escalate the nine demands the movement's making. And we're working in solidarity in like five to 12 cities on the divest demand to shift resources from the over-policing and criminalization of communities of color to uh, human and social services that black communities deserve. And this is not an easy thing. Um, it's causing a lot of tension in our union and we're using the tension uh, to strengthen cross-racial solidarity because uh, we believe what Frederick Douglass said, without struggle, there is no progress. Mm -hmm. And this intersectionality and connecting the union, not just to wages and hours and working conditions, but to a better life for everyone is essential, we think, to the rebirth of the American labor movement. We have to live in the intersection because it's who essential workers are and it's who our members are. Excellent. Michael, you got anything? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Maddie, the next question. Okay, we're going to take it over to Jess now. Hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Ajapong, and I am a senior biology major at Howard University. Um, and so, President Henry, I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but my question was um, like, how should unions be operating in strike resistant companies like Amazon? Mm -hmm. One of my hopes is that Amazon could be a multi-union uh, campaign and target. Cause I think the company has gotten too big for any one union and community organizations to take on. And um, I think what we're doing at SEIU is providing research support to a group of organizations that is supporting Amazon warehouse worker organizing. Um, we had Amazonians for the Bay Area show up at a Bay Area strike that I was on last week, and they want me to speak at a sunrise action tomorrow morning. So I think we're trying to show up in supporting their demands, both with the, the tech engineers that are organizing and with the warehouse and distribution workers uh, that are organizing. Michael, did you have anything on this? No, I'm good. No, these are some great questions. Maddie, next Okay, now we have a question from Emily. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a rising high school senior. And first, I just wanna say thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. 
So my question is, what tactics from union organizing and protests in the past do you believe are the most effective in today's political world? Michael, why don't you start that one off? Um, secondary boycott in the sense that we have to confront not just the immediate employer, but root and branch, all other parts of the capitalist economy that support that immediate employer. And um, we have to aggressively defend our First Amendment rights to say whatever we want to the consuming public about who they should do business with and who not. Um, I think the boycott, the boycott is an underutilized tactic. Uh, I think that aggressive uh, political work to demand uh, legislation that gets us things across the board that we can't get through individual bargaining is essential because we're political players as well as economic players. But Michael, take a second to explain that a quote secondary boycott is illegal today under Taft Hartley, that you're not allowed to call for boycotting somebody who is a business partner of your employer if you're an employee. Well, if, and why you think that violates the First Amendment? If we're on strike against a hotel, the current law is that we can only pick at the hotel and we can't pick at the bank that lends to them. And we can't pick at the, you know, the, the shareholders that, 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 um, that, that own stock in the hotel corporation. And, um, you know, there are arbitrary distinctions in the law where the law says you can't march around with a sign on a stick, but you might be able to hand out in eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, if all that piece of paper is doing is asking the public not to do business with the bank or with the shareholder. And unions have, have, have jumped on that distinction, but ultimately it's an incoherent distinction. At some point, if the Supreme Court claims to be in favor of the first amendment, they're gonna to have to start realizing that it's an illegal form of discrimination to say, you can have a sign that says, boycott this bank, but you can't have a sign that says, you know, bo boycott this hotel. Yeah. And then just to be clear, the, the Supreme Court has determined in a series of cases coming out of the civil rights movement, Claiborne Hardware is the original one, that you've got a right to boycott as an expression of the First Amendment. A boycott is just telling people don't shop someplace and then deciding not to shop there. And obviously you can't make it a crime not to shop someplace. So it's really the speech that's being criminalized by this ban on secondary boycotts. Thank you for that. Mary Kay, do you want to add anything to this one? This is um, Emily. I thank you for the um, question. I think the biggest thing, the oldest tactic that's the most powerful is listening to workers. I, I know this may sound kind of basic and duh, but um, that's the first thing. The second thing is unleashing the p ability of workers to be able to lead on their own behalf. I think the, the self-organizing that's happening as a result of the racial and economic justice reckoning the labor movement should be adding resource support, um, you know, megaphones, whatever people need, legal assistance in the event of arrests. Um, I just think what is happening in the movement for Le J Black Lives Uprising, the Google walkout that occurred last year where 60% of Google's entire global workforce walked out on the same day around Me Too and a set of demands was hugely inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, so those are old tactics with new like vehicles, um, but they're grounded in a basic theory that when people join together, they can make anything happen. Mm -hmm. And I think the ambition of the existing institutional labor movement has to uh, be unleashed to support the major uprisings that are occurring in every city and state around the country. Um, and so I, I just think of, well, I would rather turn the question back to you, because I have to tell you, I think high school and college students are the source of the American labor movement's reimagination of ourselves. Your leadership and your dedication to showing up on a Zoom uh, education thing like this is an indication to me that our movement uh, has hope in the next generation. And I don't want you to settle for anything less than absolutely every damn thing you want. 
And we need to, that's the other thing that organizers do is we raise expectations beyond what people say is possible. And that's a, an old tactic that has to be applied to this moment. That's awesome. And Mary Kay, I wanna commend you really for being so personally engaged and immersed in the movements with the young people and Black Lives Matter and just on the front of the barricades with people. It's very inspiring to watch. Uh, okay, Maddie, I think we got time for like two more. Sure. Uh, so our next question is from Luca. Luca. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Emily, uh, for those last ones. Uh, my name is Luca. I attend Albert Einstein High School in Kensington, Maryland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Raskin, uh, Ms. Henry, and Ms. Or Anderson for having this uh, conversation today. Uh, my question is, would having a prominent figure in the labor movement like Walter Ruther in the mid 1900s be beneficial in revitalizing unionization or does a decentralized approach seem to be more effective? Oh, well, what a great question, Mary Kay, what about that? I mean, I'd like to open need the chat and see what people in this room think. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we just honored the life of Congressman John Lewis and what he always used to say to me, it's not about any one um, singular figure. It's all the names of people that we don't know uh, that took risks and um, made uh, major shifts happen in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, when you think about the March for Our Lives that the Parkland students, you know, ignited, when you think about what Sunrise students are doing, what you think about what young people are doing around the world, um, I just think it's, I think those figures makes, make, um, help illuminate the imagination, but I don't think they're a necessary prerequisite. I think each of us deciding to act and saying, if you're a white person, I am not gonna allow um, racism uh, anymore in my life. And, then, and I'm gonna use every ounce of my being to tear down the systems and to check people on what, I think is our um, racist behavior, not because of our intention, but because of the air we breathe in this United States. So that's an indication to me of how things can shift that isn't about one kind of uh, um, popular figure or voice, but the voices of, I think the most powerful voices in our movement right now are the uh, essential workers, the Black Lives Matter movement leaders uh, that are, interpreting uh, the problem and, and painting a path to the solution. Hmm. Michael, you want to add anything to this one? No, I'll just say that I'll take Mary Kay Henry over Walter Ruther any day. <laughs> no doubt about that. All right, actually, we, we, we probably have time for two more. I see we got people lining up. So Maddie, call on somebody else. All right, uh, Laurel, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, um, I'm Laurel and I'm a rising high school senior from Frederick, Maryland. Um, and thank you so much to the three of you for organizing and speaking on this today. My question is, how can progressive advocates ensure that they form a strong coalition between themselves and unions to create change? Mary Kay, you wanna start that one? Yeah, I have to tell you what I think is central to this Laurel is we have to have a shared understanding and analysis of how anti-Black structural racism and corporate power are two blocks to winning a progressive um, governing majority. And I find with my progressive movement partners outside the labor movement and some parts of the labor movement aren't able to make the connection of how the presence of organized workers matters to winning a Green New Deal to winning immigration, you know, like we are a self-funded independent force uh, in the ecosystem that isn't reliant on philanthropic grants every year, and we can help sustain our community partners. And so uh, I think that a shared analysis of power, what's in our way and how we're gonna win it together is really key for the fusion that you're talking about between the labor movement and other parts of the progressive movement. And Michael. Yeah, I mean, uh, as with everything, um, progressive advocates can make alliances 
by listening and understanding what is driving the, the motivation of, uh, of the workers' organizations that they want to support. Um, that, that, um, that this is part of why I'm saying I, I, I don't like to be described as representing labor because that implies that, that my clients are people that, that, um, that are at the bottom of the economic ladder. I'm interested in alliances with progressive advocates or are willing to fight side by side. That's what an ally is. Right on. All right. Um, thank you for that great question too, Laurel. So um, Maddie, why don't we do one more? I hate to see this come to an end. It's such a great conversation, but I know these guys have to get back to the class struggle and uh, you guys got more work to do. So Maddie, call on someone else. Our last question is gonna be from Charlie. Hi, my name is Charlie and I'm a rising senior at Albert Einstein High School. Uh, and I was just wondering, um, since Biden's potential victory hinges on a lot of kind of Rust Belt voters that by and large support uh, fair trade and uh, union organizing, uh, do you think that that would indicate a more favorable policy towards the working class from the Biden administration? Mike, what do you say? Well, it's not so much what Biden is going to do. Biden is going to be, uh, you know, expected to sign legislation passed by a Democratic Congress that will completely overhaul labor law um, and, and, you know, get rid of, among other things, get rid of the secondary boycott prohibition, get rid of right to work laws. This is all queued up in what's called the PRO Act that's currently, um, you know, it's, it's currently in the House. Um, you know, Biden... President Biden may or may not be driving all of it, but what we really need is to get the legislation on his desk passed by Congress to sign. And that's my job. Mary Kay, what's your response to it? I, I agree with Michael and you, and I would just say, I think that question is up for grabs. And uh, the only way we're gonna ensure that uh, the next administration is pro-worker is by organizing. And uh, the elected officials respond to the um, movements making demands. And mm -hmm. so it's on us not to keep, let our foot off the gas. I think we have to turn up the heat uh, in January. Right. Uh, because the, it's just gonna get harder on people like Jamie. We won't, you know what I, like the politics of this country are so polarized and the level of hate that we have come to experience in the past four years is so intense. Mm. That's not gonna evaporate on, uh, in January. And that's why us being vigilant and continuing to build the intersectionality, the cross-racial solidarity, I think is central to how bold the shifts can be uh, next year. Well, that's awesome. That's visionary. Uh, before I thank our guests, um, I want to remind everybody out there who's not already part of the Democracy Summer Program, whether you're a young person or you're, you know, a little bit more middle aged, like me, for example, uh, and or older, like my friend Michael. Um, wh whatever, wherever you are in, uh, you know, in your life, we want you to go to jamieraskin.com slash volunteer, jamieraskin.com slash volunteer. We are calling into the swing states. We are supporting progressive Democrats running for Congress all over America, progressive Democrats for Senate. We're making it happen. These Democracy Summer Fellows are in the forefront of our civic checkup where we're calling people and asking about whatever needs they might have with respect to groceries, healthcare, unions, whatever it might be. We talk about the census and we talk about getting everybody registered to vote and ready to participate in the election. So again, uh, go to jamieraskin.com slash backslash volunteer. Um, look, Mary Kay Henry, you are a hero to us. And thank you for always making time for the young people, for being uh, right at the crossroads of the great civilizing movements of our time and getting us through the nightmare of the Trump period so we can cross over uh, to the kind of America that John Lewis was fighting for. So thank you for being with Democracy Summer today. And if there's anything you need from Democracy Summer or from me, we're always here for you, okay? 
Thank you so much. And thanks to the next generation who's going to lead us to a world that hasn't ever existed and that everyone deserves to have created, thanks to our organizing and volunteering. Thank you. All right. And thank you, Michael Anderson, uh, the great union lawyer, not labor lawyer, union lawyer, for reasons <laughs> you understand now. And uh, Michael, um, you'd be a hero to young people, too, if you knew any other than Jackson and my kids. So we can get you out there to meet some more of the Democracy Summer fellows and young people. Thank you for the great visionary work you're doing. I look forward to working with both of you as we win the election and then reconstruct and rebuild labor law in America. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Democracy Summer fellows. And thanks to everybody who's been tuning in today.